it's painful to understand how much of what you're doing isn't productive. So I'll give you an example. So I've done this a couple of times with classrooms full of students. Usually when I'm lecturing about career development, say, okay, um, how much time do you waste? So then I, I get the class to vote. How many of you waste uh, 10 hours a day? It's like 10% of the kids will put up their hands. And it's interesting because I don't define what constitutes waste. I just ask the question. So they're diagnosing themselves, right? right? I'm not saying you're wasting 10 hours a day. I'm just asking. It's like, given your own attitude, how much time are you wasting? 10 hours a day. It's like 10% of the people put up their hands. Well, when you get to like six hours a day, 80% of the people put up their hands. So then we do the arithmetic. It's like, because I like doing arithmetic with people. People hate arithmetic, but I like doing it. It's like, okay, six hours a day. It's 42 hours a week. So let's call that a work week, 40 hours a week. So, so that's, that's a work week. Let's say, what's your time worth? You're a university student. Well, it's certainly worth minimum wage, because obviously, but it's worth way more than that, because if you spend a productive hour when you're 20, then you gain the benefits of that hour for the rest of your life. So there's the compounding effect of time spent when we were young. So I say, well, let's assume your time's worth 50 bucks an hour, which I think is an underestimate, but whatever. Let's call it 50. We call it 25, but we'll call it 50. If that's $2,000 a week, you're wasted. It's $100,000 a year. It's like, how much better would your life be if you weren't wasting $100,000 a year? It's like, what is that over 40 years? $4 million. It's like, you're rich. You don't even know it. Quit wasting time. By your own definition. It's like people shake their heads. Like, oh, I never thought about it that way. It's like, yeah, think about it that way. Don't waste your damn life. And, and then you think, well, why would people be resistant to that message? It's like, well, you really want to wake up and figure out that you're wasting half your life? And you know, when people do that kind of wasting, they actually hate it. You know, and I've had lots of people come to my clinical practice who were chronic procrastinators. You know, and so they're watching YouTube videos say, but, but not ones that are good for them, although sometimes they will do that, but just browsing in that kind of mindless way that you do when you're not paying attention and you're trying to kill time. And people doing that, they feel bad, they get depressed, they feel anxious, they can't get away from it, they feel kind of quasi-addicted. That's or they what they're do saying it. about social media yeah. now, it's yeah. a huge sure. issue with young kids. Absolutely, but there's this feeling of kind of internal rot and corruption yes. that goes along with it. It's like, yeah, well, you're wasting your life. It's like, so it's painful. It's painful to recognize that. Then it's painful to think, oh my God, look how undisciplined I am. I don't know anything. I can't use a schedule. I can't, I can't stick to a calendar. I don't have any aims. I don't know anything about the world, right? And maybe there's a part of me that's bitter because I, I haven't got everything already. And I'd like, just like to say to hell with it. That's the recognition of the Jungian shadow. It's like, that's what makes you vicious and, and, and and untrustworthy, all of that. No one wants to look at that, and no bloody wonder. But, hey, the alternative is worse. I hate it when I see young people wasting their time, wasting all this technology got, just bull Just sitting around in this world that's been created for you, that everything is instant. You all have stuff at your fingertips that can make you great. But if you could combine your technology with your parents and your grandparents' work ethic, you could be rich, man. But you cannot erase the work ethic part. There is no getting around. Ain't no elevator to the top. You got to take the stands. The elevator don't go to the top, man not in the world of success. You gotta take the stairs. Y'all gotta start getting gritty, man. You gotta develop some dog in you. Most of this generation quits the second they get talked to. You did this wrong, you did this wrong, or, or they get yelled at. It's so easy to, you know, to, to be great nowadays, because everybody else is, most people are, are weak. This, this is a softened generation. So if you have any mental toughness, any, any ability, the have any fraction of self-discipline, the ability to not want to do it, but still do it. Play the long game, aim for legendary. Say, I wanna have the guts and the grit and the acumen and the mindset and the capability and the commitment to create enduring success. 
be the person who is up reading, listening to the podcast, writing in your journal, setting your goals, focusing on your intentions. As you become more successful, become more humble. As you become more successful, work even harder. As you become more successful, care even more about your product. As you become more successful, learn even more. Dedication, hard work. Dedication, hard work. I want my arm. It won't go against me. I'm still coming on top. I need you to go harder than you've ever gone before. I need you to be more dedicated than you've ever been before. Life's one big fucking head game. You play with yourself. If you lose, it's because you allow life to get in your fucking head. It's you. You've got to make it your personal business to make it happen. And you've got to resolve within yourself that I'm the one. I'm the one to make this happen. I'm the one to become successful. I'm the one. I'm the one. No matter how bad it is or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. I must say a word about fear. It is life's only true opponent. Only fear can defeat life. It is a clever, treacherous adversary, how well I know. It has no decency, respects no law or convention, shows no mercy. It goes for your weakest spot, which it finds with unnerving ease. It begins in your mind, always... So you must fight hard to express it. You must fight hard to shine the light of words upon it. Because if you don't, if your fear becomes a wordless darkness that you avoid, perhaps even manage to forget, you open yourself to further attacks of fear because you never truly fought the opponent who defeated you. What man actually needs is not a tensionless state, but rather the striving and struggling for a worthwhile goal, a freely chosen task. What he needs is not the discharge of tension at any cost, but the call of a potential meaning waiting to be fulfilled by him. Mankind was apparently doomed to vacillate between the two extremities of distress and boredom. In actual fact, boredom is now causing more problems to solve that distress. And these problems are growing increasingly crucial, for progressive automation will probably lead to an enormous increase in the leisure hours available to the average worker. The pity of it is that many of these will not know what to do with all their newly acquired free time. Life is not primarily a quest for pleasure, as Freud believed, or a quest for power, as Alfred Adler taught, but a quest for meaning. The greatest task for any person, the greatest task for any person is to find meaning in his or her life. Frankel saw three possible sources for meaning. In work, doing something significant. In love, caring for another person. And in courage during difficult times. Suffering in and of itself is meaningless. We give our suffering meaning by the way in which we respond to it. At one point, Frankel writes that a person may remain brave, dignified and unselfish, or in the bitter fight for self-preservation, he may forget his human dignity and become no more than an animal. The meaning of life differs from man to man, from day to day, from hour to hour. What matters, therefore, is not the meaning of life in general, but rather the specific meaning of a person's life at a given moment. To put the question in general terms would be to the question posed to a chess champion. Tell me, master, what is the best move in the world? There simply is no such thing as the best or even a good move, apart from a particular situation in a game and the particular personality of one's opponent. The same holds for human existence. One should not search for an abstract meaning of life. Everyone has his own specific vocation or mission in life to carry out a concrete assignment which demands fulfillment. Therein he cannot be replaced, nor can his life be repeated. Thus everyone's task is as unique as is his specific opportunity to implement it. As each situation in life represents a challenge to man and presents a problem for him to solve, the question of the meaning of life may actually be reversed. Ultimately, man should not ask what the meaning of life is, but rather he must recognize that it is he who is asked. In a word, each man is questioned by life, and he can only answer to life by answering for his own life. To life, he can only respond by being responsible. The way in which a man accepts his fate and all the suffering it entails, the way in which he takes up his cross, gives him ample opportunity, even under the most difficult circumstances, 
to add a deeper meaning to his life, it may remain brave, dignified, and unselfish. Or in the bitter fight for self-preservation, he may forget his human dignity and become no more than an animal. Here lies the chance for a man either to make use of or forgo the opportunities of attaining the moral values that a difficult situation may afford him. And this decides whether he is worthy of his sufferings or not.